nobody is uh, steering the asteroids that are going to hit, and uh, the Earth uh, being bigger uh, just happens to get hit more often. So what we do is we count the big craters on the moon, and then we uh, scale up to the much larger size of the Earth, and we find that the Earth was hit by asteroids as large as 500 kilometers across at the same time that the moon was being hit by asteroids that are 100 or 200 kilometers across. This is an impression of the relative sizes. The largest is 500 kilometers. That's over 300 miles across. Earth may have been hit as many as six times by an asteroid this size. You have a 500 kilometer object moving at 20 kilometers a second, stopping in 20 seconds, delivering all of its energy in doing so. And you produce an enormous explosion. The amount of energy that you, that is released in this event is more than enough to evaporate the world's oceans. A massive asteroid from outer space heads straight for Earth. It's as large as the one that impacted over four billion years ago. This computer simulation has been made with the scientific advice of geophysical experts to show the effects if the impact were to happen today. The asteroid's diameter is larger than the main island of Japan. Even though it is moving at over 720,000 kilometers an hour, that's almost 450,000 miles an hour, the asteroid appears eerily slow because of its size. The actual impact happens in the Pacific Ocean, just under 1,000 miles south of Japan. The crust of the Earth is peeled away like an orange skin by what is called the crest tsunami. Even the deepest part of the Pacific Ocean looks like a thin film. Huge chunks of debris the size of city blocks are hurled into the air. The entire Japanese archipelago is disintegrated, as is some of the Asian continent. The shattered remains are hurled out into space way beyond the atmosphere to bombard the Earth with deadly intent when they re-enter. At 7,000 meters, 23,000 feet, the rim of the crater is higher than many mountains on Earth today. The size of the crater would be a distance of 2,500 miles or 4,000 kilometers. And this is just the start. NASA has the world's largest collision test machine used to try and find out what would happen after the moment of impact? Okay. Dr. Peter Schultz fills a small tank with water to see how the ocean would react. The actual impact object is tiny, but it will hit the water at a speed 20 times faster than a bullet fired from a pistol. Oh, that is gorgeous. Just one tiny aluminium bullet had this result.
But the impact which created mayhem is not the entire story. To get the full picture, the moment of impact has been slowed down so that one second seems to last an eternity. At the moment of impact, it is like slamming the brakes on. The kinetic energy of the bullet is transformed into heat. White smoke rises. It may look like a splash, but it is actually water vapor. The heat vaporizes the water in an instant. And heat has a deadly potential. When an asteroid hits the surface of the Earth, the material is heated up to temperatures that get up to the point of, say, 4,000 to 6,000 degrees centigrade. This is as hot as the surface of the sun. An experiment was carried out at Hokkaido University in northern Japan to try and discover what could happen to the rock bed at the point of impact. A tiny rock was put into a special oven that could cook the sample to a temperature of over 2,000 Celsius, 3,600 Fahrenheit. As the temperature rose higher, the rock began to melt and boil like water. The gas produced is called rock vapor. The rock vapor, when we generate this rock vapor, it will expand extremely fast. It expands so quickly that it can cover eventually the entire planet. When an impact hits, it's not just the crater that forms, it's not just the area where the impact occurred. It's all the heating that's created in the atmosphere and around it. So heat really is the killer. Moments after the impact, rock vapor, the temperature of the sun, begins to engulf the world. Could any life at all survive this impact? Immediately after the impact, the rock vapor rises up from the crater in a dome, then spreads out in all directions across the globe. Three hours after the impact south of Japan, the expanding wall of vaporized rock reaches the mountains of the Himalayas. The perpetual snows are instantly evaporated. Soon the wall of fire reaches the Amazon, the furthest distance from the point of impact. The forest spontaneously combusts even before the rock vapor arrives. Just one day after the impact, the entire planet is covered. Every living plant or creature is vaporized. It's been estimated that this vapor would cover the entire globe for almost a year. It would be as if the sun had come to Earth. The ocean would start to bubble and boil. And as the water evaporates, the oceans would drop at the rate of five centimeters or two inches every second. Even the salt deposited on the ocean floor vaporizes, and then the very bottom of the sea melts. Nothing is left untouched. One month after the impact, 
the surface of the world has been sterilized. The oceans have vanished. All that remains is the superheated bedrock. It is thought that an impact like this happened six times in the violent past of the Earth's history. If there was life, it was assumed that it too would have been wiped out, only to begin again. But now science is not so certain. Now there is the strong likelihood that life, despite the odds, has survived. But how could that be possible? With the oceans gone, where could life have found a sanctuary from the searing heat? A clue to the answer was found in salt. These salt lakes in the American Southwest are the remnants of an ancient sea. Millions of years ago in the Permian era, the upheaval of the bedrock drained the oceans and left behind these lakes. Dr. Russell Vreeland is a microbiologist based at Westchester University. He has been studying the survival strategies of microbes and has come up with some remarkable results. His study site is a repository for nuclear waste located beside one of the lakes. The waste site is right in the middle of nearly half a mile of rock salt. Over time, this salt gradually expands, which is why it makes a good storage medium. But if nuclear waste can be locked out, traces of ancient microorganisms could be locked in. The salt crystals within these walls have lain untouched and uncontaminated since the ocean dried out millions of years before. Find some areas with the pipe. There. Yeah, here's one here. Yeah. With the... And inside the crystals, Dr. Vreeland thought he might find traces of the microbes that lived in that long dead ocean very good example actually in my opinion because we have very nice defined bands and striations we have and each of those represents a tiny tiny uh, droplet of the Permian Ocean that was trapped and has been held in that crystal for 200 million years to him these crystals are as valuable as any gemstone Inside the crystal are minute droplets of the seawater trapped within as the salt crystallized. A tiny hole was drilled so that the drop of water could be released. Perfectly shaped microorganisms named Bacillus permiens were found, relics from the past. But the next finding was truly extraordinary. For four months, the microbes were fed with a nutrient broth. They began to divide, then multiply vigorously. After slumbering through tens of millions of years, they had come awake. Bacterium that we found in the crystal 